I watched Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer last night in IMAX at 11 o'clock. Uh, the movie didn't end until 2 a.m., and in the hour-long drive back, uh, I couldn't stop thinking about the movie. And even now, the next day, it's still on my mind. And uh, this isn't a review for the movie, but I will say that um, just general thoughts, I do recommend you watch it as a baseline. And also, I don't think a very many people could make a three-hour-long biopic that's shot in IMAX, presented in semi-black and white, with a budget of $200 million other than Christopher Nolan. And I don't think you could really do this with another subject than J. Robert Oppenheimer, who, uh, of course, is one of the key figures of creating the atomic bomb. I'm not going to go any further into it than that. I do recommend you watch it. But having watched the movie it's one of those that just really sits with you um, once you finish it. And so I, I've been thinking about it, and I realized uh, two things. One, I think that the conversations that happen in this movie are pro probably one of the most significant in human history. Like, the, the things were said and uh, possibilities were laid out for, for things that would have, I mean, that, that did change the world uh irrevo irrevo irre irrevocably you you i hope you understand what i'm saying but nevertheless the second thing is that uh i don't know a whole lot about oppenheimer i mean uh i actually back in college i took this pop culture class that will i will fully admit was just because it had uh, it was easy credits and our final for that class was you had to pick a topic uh, of, of anything you'd want and you'd, you'd pitch it as a video game. Like you could do whatever it was. Um, you know, some people I think did uh, like hospital stuff, but it was like a platform or something. I, I don't remember. I, I only remember that I, or my group, uh, pitched a, a video game that was, um, <clears throat> I'd say compare it to something like a telltale like it was a telltale-esque game that was um based off of the center around the, the manhattan project i didn't really know and obviously i knew oppenheimer's name because of that but i didn't know exactly who he was or like ex for the full extent of, of his knowledge oh my god uh, kevin hello mr brown phd nice to see you again i'm glad to see you alive and more skinny you know it's been a it's been a it's been a journey but uh kevin thank you so much for subscribing a tier three subscription and you are now 29 months subbed in a row i appreciate it thank you very much but um yeah so i, I that was our i didn't know too much about oppenheimer but i it did pitch a manhattan project video game that was sort of like a telltale i still think that would be pretty pretty interesting if i'm going to be completely honest um but but with that said, I'm willing to admit that I don't know something, and this is something that this as in this this what we're doing right here is something that I've had an idea for for a while. It's sort of inspired by those like Wikipedia speed runs that you see, but this is like the complete opposite. Like this is a Wikipedia like slow run. If anything, we're gonna go down the rabbit hole to see what we can find out about Oppenheimer, and then anything else that, that kind of comes up for the next hour or so you know, we'll see how long it goes i have no no real kind of uh target here hopefully at the end of this we're gonna be uh we're, we're gonna learn something or two i hope um but with that said i hope you guys are if you guys are excited grab me i'm always here at the uh, the pinnacle of of riveting content um and you know that's what I'm, that's what i'm doing here amigo you are a blessed to watch oppenheimer and imax my nearest theater is 400 miles Away, I hope to watch it uh, next week in standard quality. I, I do think that I mean, obviously, this is, is I do like watching movies on the big screen. I have to drive fifty minutes to still to see Oppenheimer in IMAX, um, but I, I it was I mean it was one of those like when the sound mix is so like visceral that like you know it, it like hits you when like certain explosions and stuff happen, and then also the end of the movie I, I like I didn't realize how tense I was until like as soon as the title hit came on I was like oh my god I was like holding myself the whole time 
But nevertheless, uh, let's let's switch over to the, the very simple start here. The very simple start, but let's let's go down the rabbit hole. Rob J. Robert Oppenheimer who was born in April twenty second, nineteen oh four, in New York, New York, and then uh, died in February eighteenth of nineteen sixty seven in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, Julius Robert Oppenheimer, first of all, already off to a great start. I didn't know his name was Julius, um, was an American theoretical physicist and the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory during World War II. He's often credited as, credited as the father of the atomic bomb for her, his role in uh, organizing the Manhattan Project, the research and development undertaking that created the first nuclear weapons. Um, <clears throat> We'll, we'll talk about it. I'm not going to get too... Uh, I'll, 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 we'll take it slow. We'll take it slow. But here we go. Let's... Um, oh, CNN has an article about it. But we're going to go... We're going to go to the trusted source of all high school newspaper writers... Or uh, essay writers, I should say. Um, so we read the first paragraph. Born in New York City to Jewish immigrants from Germany, Oppenheimer earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Harvard University in 1925 and a PhD in physics from the uh, University of Göttingen in Germany in 1927. After research at other institutions, he joined the physics department at UK, uh, University of California, Berkeley, where he became a full professor in 1936. He made a significant contribution. He made significant contributions to theoretical physics, including achievements in quantum mechanics and nuclear physics, such as such as the Born-Oppenheimer approximation to to molecular wave functions. What is that? In quantum chemistry and molecular physics, the Born-Oppenheimer, uh, the BO approximation, is best known mathematical approximation in molecular dynamics. Specifically, it is the assumption that the wave functions of atomic nuclei and electrons in a molecule can be treated separately based on the fact that the nuclei are much heavier than the electrons. Due to the larger relative mass of a nucleus com uh, compared to an electron, the coordinates of the nuclei in a system are approximated as fixed, while the new coordinates of the electrons are dynamic. Wow. <laughs> the approach is named after Max Born and his 23-year-old graduate student J. Robert Oppenheimer, the latter of whom, the latter of whom, proposed in 1927 during a period of intense ferment uh, in the development of quantum mechanics. Oh, I didn't read that right. Pur purposed it, not proposed. I don't know what I said there. Yeah, uh, most of that was over my head. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. This is um, another thing that kept going through my head as I was watching the movie of this is someone I would I would hate to be in the headspace of I feel like knowing that much and the movie does kind of also play into that as well um, but the, the idea of like there's um, so much kind of knowledge there that it, it not not like knowledge corrupts or anything like that but um, just like it, it has to feel like a burden knowing what is cap what you're capable of doing and what you know what, especially then because you it wasn't public now we know that there's something called an atomic bomb that like that that it has dropped but like when you're working on it the the idea of like you don't know what can happen and when, once it's out there it's out there and um, it would be I would find it hard to hard to be an optimist if if you were in in someone like Oppenheimer, for example. But anyway, let's get back. Uh, work on the theory of electrons and positrons. Uh, the Oppenheimer-Phillips process in nuclear f fusion. Oh, okay. So that's he's something else, else he's known for. Um, uh, the Oppenheimer-Phillips pro uh, process in nuclear fusion and the first prediction of quantum tunneling. I think I do know. Maybe I could have. I, I could have a grasp on what quantum tunneling is. Could, could immediately we have this formula just um i don't even people can read that people look at that and go, yeah I, I know what that is i know what that is in physics quantum tunneling barrier penetration or simply tunneling is a quantum mechanical uh phenomenon in which an object such as an electron or atom passes through a potential energy barrier that according to classical mechanics the object does not have sufficient energy to enter or surmount 
Tunneling is a consequence of a wave nature of matter, where the quantum wave function uh, describes the state of a particle or other physical system and wave equations, such as the Schrodinger equation, describe their behavior. The probability of transmission of a wave packet through a barrier decreases exponentially with the barrier height, the barrier width, and the, bar and the tunneling particle's mass. So tunneling is seen most prominently in low mass particles such as electrons or protons tunneling through microscopically narrow barriers. I can kind of understand that. I am interested in what the Schrodinger equation is this the I, I mean obviously there's Schrod Schroding Schrodinger's cat. Right? Am I am I crazy? Is that a different Schrodinger's cat? Introducing his original formula, a cat, a flask of position, and a uh, radio, sorry, radioactive source were sealed in a, uh, in a, okay, I do know this, are placed in a sealed box. If an in, uh, in, internal monitor, uh, a Geiger counter, detects radioactivity, the flask is shattered, releasing the poison, which kills the cat. Uh, I believe the, let's see here, we're back to fucking Wikipedia. Uh, it is a thought experiment that illustrates a paradox of quantum super, super, superposition. Actually, this is interesting. So, for <laughs> hello, hello, Alexa. Thank you for subscribing. Um, this is interesting. I read a book, which is a really, really good book. It's called Dark Matter. It was the first time I read it, uh, but it's been on my reading list for a while. And it actually is about the kind of, it, it about like the idea of a quantum superposition. So essentially, the, the, the core concept, it, mine are spoilers for this, by the way. I mean, this is the core concept, but the, if you, I, I went in knowing nothing about it. So for me, it was a little bit of a surprise. If you're like against that whole thing, skip like three minutes ahead. Uh, so I'll, I'll remember to stop talking about it in three minutes. Um, but essentially, the idea is you do exactly what, you know, you go into this box. And uh, for them, they essentially, w w w the idea is, I'll read this. So in the thought experiment, a hypothetical cat may be considered simultaneously both alive and dead while it is unobserved in a closed box as a result of its fate being linked to a random subatomic event that may or may not occur. This thought experiment was devised by a uh, physicist Edwin Sh uh, er Erwin sorry, Schrodinger in 1935 in a discussion with Albert Einstein to illustrate that Schrodinger, uh, that Schrodinger saw as the problems of the Copenhagen uh interpretation of quantum mechanics so so there's problems with the copenhagen inter interpretation so yeah the idea in the book is that you go into this chamber you know where it is a, a chamber that you that it, you cannot observe uh from the outside you the and so the idea is when you go in and these ser series of things happen they also like take a a, a shot that pretty much like puts him this in the, into this lucid state which i think is like the book's kind of like you know the, the way of like being like that's how humans can possibly like make it through this okay i don't know what's going on uh, my, my 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 watch will not stop be tapping me on the on the wrist um so i'll keep going but while you're in there because again you can't be observed and just kind of like the whole thing of like it, it's not until the you like someone opens the door and then makes an observation that it, it it solidifies that as like that is the reality that is what happened so obviously here they're talking about the idea of the cat you don't know if you you know you don't know if the cat's alive or dead until you open it open the box but then when you when you open the box it definitively like it's unknown until you do it you know what i mean like that, that that's kind of the whole idea of it but in, in the book they take it a step further and they're like okay what if humans could traverse through that and then in that kind of the the position of quantum superposition it, you can travel the multiverse that that is that is that is the idea of that very very good book and uh, one that just kept me kept me going kept me guessing back to the Stro Stro schrodinger how why am i struggling to say this name Schrodinger's equation is a linear particle differential equation that governs the wave function of a quantum mechanical system. 
His discovery was a significant landmark in the uh, development of quantum mechanics. The equation is named after uh, Edwin Schrodinger, of course. Uh, forming the basis of the work that resulted in his Nobel Prize in physics in 1933. So conceptually, the Schrodinger equation is a quantum counterpart to Newton's second law in classic mechanics. Given a set of known initial conditions, Newton's second law makes a mathematical prediction as to what a path, uh, on what path a given physical system will take over time. Okay. The Schrodinger equation gives the uh, evolution over time of a wave function. The quantum mechanical characterization is uh, of an uh, isolated physical system. The equation was populated, sorry, what the hell did I just read? The equation was postulated by Schrodinger based on a uh, pro <laughs> postulate of Louis D. Broglie? Broglie? Bragli, that all matter has an associated matter wave. The equation predicted bound states of atom uh, of the atom in agreement with experimental observations. It's like, again, so th these people are so smart, man. Good lord. Still very interesting, though. With his students, he also uh, we're back to Oppenheimer for anyone that's like just listening, that's like you know just trying to like you know doing whatever. I don't know how you. Good, good for you. Thank you for listening to it while you're doing something else. But um, with his students, he also made contributions to the theory of neutron stars and black holes, quantum field theory, and the interactions of cosmic rays. What the, what the hell? Just casually, and with his students, he's just like, hey, let me let me help you figure out shit about black holes. Again, another thing that's like I like it's such. It, it's such a uh, the idea that again there is something out there that could deem the end of all existence, and you know to know to know about it in such great detail. Though it is different, obviously, black holes are much more out of our uh, out of our, out of our control. So it's not like you know we can make. What if we made a black hole, dude? Wait, wait what? What the? Is that possible? You think some lab? I'm sure there's some lab there's someone like, hmm, how do we create a black hole? How do we contain a black hole? Uh, <laughs> a black hole weapon. Can you imagine? It's like the next, you know, gigantic freaking bomb. I mean, I, I don't think you'd be able to, I don't think you'd be able to stop it. If it was, I mean, again, because I don't even know Look, it's smart. I'm I'm here. I'm I'm a writer. Okay, I, I write books and I and I make movies. Like I, I, I'm not. I'm here just for the creative creativity. I'm just trying to learn some things along the way. But um, so I'm just here for the cool ideas. And so like, obviously, this is on the basis the the wildly crazy f basis that like you could make a a black hole, right? It would be the end all. It would be like the fail safe. Like, hey, don't mess with us. We're crazy. We got a we got a black hole, and we're we're not afraid to use it. And then obviously there's the question of AI, but I'm not gonna get into that because now I'm like, what? What if is it was that how you get rid of a power hungry AI? You have a power hungry AI that's like on on the loose, and you just like, okay, we gotta we gotta drop a black hole on this bitch. <laughs> I, Look, look. This is this is how I write my books. Uh, I'm not saying I'm writing a book about a, a black hole bomb, but in 1942, Oppenheimer was recruited to work on the Manhattan Project. In 1943, he was appointed director of the project's Los. Uh, so one year later, uh, of the project's Los Alamos laboratory in New Mexico, tasked with developing the first nuclear weapons. Four years after the start of the German nuclear weapons program. His leadership and scientific expertise were instrumental in the project's success. On July 16th, 1945, he was present at the first test of the atomic bomb, Trinity. In 19... Oh, sorry. In, uh, let, hold on. And, and then in August uh, of 1945, the weapons were used against Japan in the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which remain only the only use of nuclear weapons in armed conflict. I do believe that they were uh, used, obviously, like a lot of a lot more testing was done than... Is that the... F That's a fake, right? That, that, is that a fake? 
image. I'm on Wikipedia for the Trinity nuclear test, and there's a freaking video. Yeah, can I just roll over this? Is this, is this fake? A time last de detonation? Is that the real thing? Holy shit. It says time lapse detonation of gadget, which is the codename for Trinity Nuclear Weapons Test, July 16th, 1945. Is that it? Dude, that can't. Whoa, dude. Is that real? It, it would make sense, I guess, that they would that they would have video of it, but God, God, dude, what the? That nation and subsequent mushroom cloud of the gadget uh, with an estimated yield of 25 kilotons of TNT. What the? F Jesus. I don't think I've ever seen an atomic bomb. Like obviously, I've seen simulations. Is that, again, I'm still blown away. If that is real, I've, I've, I'm, I mean, that's crazy. Have you guys seen a, a what is this normal? Anyway, I go, I, I, I digress. <laughs> Trinity was the code name of the first detonation of a nuclear weapon. It was conducted by the United States Army at 5:29 a.m. Uh, MWT. Is that Mountain Time? No. On July 16th, 1945, as part of the Manhattan Project, the test was conducted in the, uh, oh, God damn, Jornada, J-O-R-N-A-D-A, Del Muerto Desert, about 35 miles southeast of Socorro, New Mexico. Another thing I think I may have said wrong. Uh, on what was the White Sands pr uh, pr Proving Grounds, uh, which... Uh, having been changed in July 9th, 9th, 1945. Prior to this change, it was the Al Almograto Bombing and Gunnery Range. Switching hands. The facility is now part of White Hands Missile Range. The only structures originally in the vicinity were the McDonald Ranch House and its ex uh, uh, ancillary buildings, which scientists used as a laboratory for testing bomb components. A base camp was constructed, and there were uh, 425 people present on the weekend of the test. The code name was assigned by uh, uh, Robert <laughs> J. Robert Oppenheimer, the director of Los Alamos, inspired by the poetry of John Don D O N N E. The best was uh, that. Sorry, the test was an uh, implosion design plutonium device, nicknamed the Gadget, of the same design as the Fat Man bomb, later detonated over Nagasaki, Japan, on August 9th, nineteen forty-five. The complexity of the design required a major effort for the Los Alamos laboratory, and concerns about whether it would work led to a discussion. Uh, to a whether it would work led to a decision to conduct the first nuclear test. The, the test was planned and directed by Kenneth Bainbridge. Wow. Uh, fears of a fizzle, uh, fears of a fizzle prompted uh, construction of a jumbo, a steel uh, containment vessel that would contain the plutonium, allowed it to be recovered, but ultimately uh, jumbo, I think it's jumbo, was not used in the test. On May 7th, 1945, a rehearsal was conducted uh, during which 108 short, short tons of high explosives spiked with radioactive isotopes were detonated. The gadgets, the gadgets detonation released the explosive uh, energy of 25 kilotons of TNT. Uh, observers included uh, everyone, uh, Vin Vinivar, Vinivar Bush, James Chadwick, James Conant, uh, Thomas Farrell, Pharrell, Enrico Ferme, Hans Beth, Richard F uh, Finman, Leslie Groves, Robert J Robert Oppenheimer, Frank Oppenheimer, his brother, uh, Jeffrey Taylor, Richard Tolman, Edward Teller, and John von Neumann. The test was declared a National Historic Landmark District in 1965 and listed on the National Register of Historical Places the following year. Oh my God, Joey! Thank you for subscribing, Richard Feynman. Sweet, thank you very much for the correction, Joey, and uh, thank you for subscribing for thirteen months. You are ind indeed halfway to Alexa's subscription. Oh, okay, wow. 
so there it is in uh, New Mexico, the Trinity nuclear test. Oh, oh, here, here this is actually, I wanted to look this up, but I, I just scrolled down and it's there. The exact origin of the word, of the code name Trinity uh, for the test is unknown, but it is often attributed to Oppenheimer as a reference to the poetry of John Donne. If you were to cor correct me uh, uh, in that pronunciation as well which in turn references the Christian uh, belief of the Trinity, God as being the uh, existing of, uh, being existing as three people. In 1962, Groves wrote to Oppenheimer that the origin of the name uh, about the origin of the name, um, asking if he had chosen it because it was a name common to rivers and peaks in the West and would not attract attention and elicited this reply. Uh, this is, I'm guessing, the reply of Oppenheimer. He said, I did suggest it, but not on that ground. Why I chose the name is not clear, but I know what thoughts were in my mind. There is a poem of John Donne written just before his death, which I know and love. From it, from it a quotation. At west and east, in all flat maps, and I am one, are one, so death doth touch the resurrection. That still does not make a trinity, but in another better known dev devotional poem, Don opens, Batter my heart, three personed God. Oh my goodness, man. And he, he's not just smart, he's into poetry too. What a romantic. Also, he is like a womanizer, apparently, <laughs> according to uh, pretty much, I mean, the movie as well really kind of talks about that as well, like the fact that he is. Uh, uh, had a few flings, though he did eventually end up. I think uh, only he uh, he says fast only only married uh, Catherine Kitty. Oh boy, Pooning, Pointing. Feel, feel free. Um, <laughs> correct me. Uh, then he had two children. He married uh, Kitty in 1940. So in 1947, after the the bombs had dropped two years after the bombs had dropped Oppenheimer became the director of the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton New Jersey and chaired the influential General Advisory Committee of the newly created United States Army and Atomic Energy Commission he lobbied for international control of nuclear power to uh, avert nuclear pr uh, proliferation and a nuclear arms race with the Soviet Union. He opposed the development of the hydrogen bomb during a 1949-1950 governmental debate on the question, and subsequently uh, on the question, and subsequently took uh, positions of defense-related issues uh, that provoked the ire of some of the U.S. government and uh, military factions. During the Second Red Scare, Oppenheimer stances together. Uh, during the Red, Second Red Scare, Oppenheimer stances together, uh, together with the past associations he had with the people and uh, organizations affiliated with the Communist Party of the USA led to the revocation of uh, his uh, irrevocable. That's what I was trying to say in the intro. Damn. <sighs> I keep sending uh, Sri my receipts, apparently. It is true. I do, I do keep getting your, your receipts. Uh, what the hell was I? That's what I was trying to say in the intro, though. <laughs> I'm glad we could go back to that. Uh, led to the revocation of his security clearance following a 1954 security hearing, effectively, which is also something that is in the movie, effectively stripped of his uh, direct political influence. He continued to lecture, write, and work in physics. In 1963, President John F. Kev Kennedy awarded him and Lyndon B. Johnson presented him with the Enrico Fermi Award as a gesture of political rehabilitation. In 2022, the U.S. government vacated its 1954 decision, saying that the process had been flawed. So it took them that long until 2022. Look at look at Street with that sweet ass mustache. Hey, that's what I'm here for, guys. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to deliver the goods and also read. So it took them until from 1954 to 2022, last year, for them to be like, hey, maybe maybe there was something. Wow. wow, the U.S. government did said it was wrong. I know that's really what's that's the probably the craziest part. The, the we we're like yeah, wow, we made a mistake here. It is interesting. There is a point that 
the John. Should I say? I'll say this very briefly. Not spoilers again. This happened in real life, but John F. Kennedy is mentioned in Oppenheimer. It's interesting that he actually awarded him with uh, the Enrique Fermi Award. Now, I'm gonna. Well, give me a second. One second. Where hell? Where the hell was the Trinity again? So, am I wrong in saying? Is, wasn't his name involved in there, Fermi? Enrico Fermi. So he was actually wait. So he was awarded the Enrico Fermi Award as a gesture of political rehabilitation, and Enrico Fermi was actually at the Trinity test. He's an Italian and later a naturalized American physicist and the creator of the world's first nuclear reactor, the Chicago Pile 1. He has been called the architect of the nuclear age and the, arch- ar- the architect of the atomic bomb. He was uh, one of the, f- the very few physicists in excel, uh, to excel in both theoretical physics and experimental physics. Fermi was awarded in 1938 the uh, uh, Nobel uh, Prize in Physics uh, for his work on induced radioactivity uh, by neuron bombardment and the discovery of transuranium elements. <laughs> My God. So, okay. So, yeah, he w- that, that's that. Let's go. Let's see what this the Enrico Fermi Award is a scientific uh, award conferred by the President of the United States. It is awarded to honor scientists and uh, international stature of international stature for their lifetime achievement in development, use, or production of energy. It is established in 1956 by the United States Department of Energy in memorial of Italian American physicist. Uh, Enrico Fermi and his work in the development of nuclear power. The recipient of the award receives one hundred thousand dollars, a certified signed a certificate signed by the president uh, and the uh, Secretary of Energy, uh, and a gold medal featuring the likeness of Enrico Fermi. Look at that! It's a conspiracy. <laughs> it's true. Oh wow! Look at that! And there's a full list of people who have won it. So the last, the last one was this year, actually. And then the one before that was 2014. So there's no uh, kind of... It's not like a yearly thing. It's just like whenever there's someone notable, they just they do it in that time. My God. I am... I mean, look, we're we're like a half hour into this, and I'm, I've, I feel like I'm... I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm scratching the surface. But also, like, there's so much going on. It's... it's, it's I mean, I'm... I'm I hope you guys are enjoying this. At the very least, it's just it's my it's my it's my voice. So you guys are settled in that regard. Don't even have to worry about it. Uh, Oppenheimer was born in the non-observant Jewish family in New York City in April 20, uh, 22, 1904 to uh, El, Ella, uh, a painter, and Julius, a successful tech, uh, textile uh, importer. Uh, we don't need to. Robert had a younger brother, Frank, who uh, also became a physicist uh, and who later founded the Exploratorium Science Museum in San Francisco. Interesting. At the age of 18, excuse me, Oppenheimer uh, entered Harvard College where he majored in chemistry. Harvard also required studies in history, uh, literature, and philosophy or mathematics. He compensated for his uh, late start by taking six courses each term instead of the usual four, because why not? They're going to Harvard Harvard to study uh, freaking chemistry. Why not do a little bit of, uh, overload the work a little bit, you know? He, he was admitted to the undergraduate honor society Phi Beta Kappa. Yo, hell yeah. And was, gradu- <laughs> was granted a uh, graduate standing in... Uh, was granted graduate standing in physics on the basis of independent study, which meant that he could bypass the basic courses in favor of, of advanced ones. He was attracted to uh, experimental physics on it by a course of on ther- thermodynamics taught by Percy Bridgman. Brigman, Brigman, nineteen twenty-five. After only three years, dude, are you kidding me? After only three years, Oppenheimer graduated from uh, Harvard with a bachelor's degree, uh, summa cum laude. Uh, holy shit, dude. Oh, my God. How are you so smart? What? What the hell? <sighs> Hashtag sweet-ass mustache. I'm glad we're focusing on the real important thing here. Not this man's fucking three-year Harvard study to, to just... Oh, my 
good goodness, dude. Uh, after being accepted to Christ College, Cambridge in 1924, Oppenheimer wrote to Ernest Rutherford requesting permission to work at the Cavendish Laboratory, though Brigman's letter of recommendation said that Oppenheimer's clumsiness in the laboratory suggested that theoretical physics rather than experimental would be his forte. Interesting, so he's a clumsy person. <laughs> I knew I had something in common with a genius. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay. Uh, Rutherford was unimpressed, but Oppenheimer went to Cambridge nonetheless. He was uh, ultimately accepted by J.J. J. Thompson by the condition that he would complete a basic laboratory course. Oppenheimer was very unhappy at Cambridge and wrote to a friend, quote, I am having a pretty bad time. <laughs> honestly, dude, if, honestly, probably, probably me too. Probably me too if I was in that. After this new uh, history, we need to watch the nuclear history of Pakistan versus India. I feel like that's a whole nother episode, Kevin. A whole nother episode where we look at the just the general conflict between between Pakistan and India. Uh, because, you know, again, another topic that uh, while I do know uh, probably more than like uh, the average person, considering I am Indian, but I, I'd still probably, I, I could definitely learn a lot more about it. Um, but, you know, let me know. Let me know. Maybe, maybe we'll do it sometime. But uh, let's see. <laughs> but anyway, back to, back to this quote. Uh, I am having a very bad time. The lab is the lab work is a terrible bore, and I am so bad at it that it is impossible to feel that I am learning anything. He developed an antagonistic relationship with his tutor, Patrick Blackett, according to Oppenheimer's friend. Oh, that's unquote. By the way, we're done there. Um, uh, according to Oppenheimer's friend, Francis Ferguson, Oppenheimer once confessed to leaving an apple dosed with noxious chemicals on Blackett's desk. That's real. That was. I mean, it makes sense why. Demi Wright Street, that is a great mustache. Guys, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate, I appreciate that. <laughs> See, this is I, this is all the validation I needed. I, I, I sat there. I, I looked in the mirror. I was like, mm, I need to get rid of this beard. And I was like, should I shave it all? And I was like, no. I want to look like a, 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 a cool, you know? I want to look friggin' dope. So, um, yeah, I'm glad the mustache is working on you guys. That's, that's the only reason why you guys are still uh, watching this. So, yeah, he left an apple doused with noxious chemicals on Blackett's desk. Oppenheimer's parents, uh, first of all, uh, troubled, maybe? I don't know if I would ever... I mean... I don't know how I'd feel about someone. You know, if I'm talking to Austin sometime, and he's like, you know, even if it's like 10 years from now, he's like, by the way, dude, I, I almost... I almost fucking I put rat poison in your Chipotle and I was like, What? <laughs> no, but it's okay. I threw it out though before you before you ate it, but like Yeah, that would be that's fucked up. Uh Abenheimer sounds a bit like a psycho uh, or a sociopath. I I'm not excusing the uh the leaving of a uh, of a of an apple doused with chemicals. Um but certainly goes back to the idea of that, you know, when you're at a certain level of, of intelligence, it's got to be. Some things just are, are uh, a little fucked up. <laughs> you can't be that smart and also not fucked up. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, want, I want Chipotle with the side of rat poison. <laughs> this, is a, this is special, yeah. Oppenheimer's parents convinced uh, the university uh, authorities not to press criminal charges or expel him, but Oppenheimer was pop uh, I didn't uh, placed on probation and had to have regular sessions with a uh, psychiatric oh psychiatrist uh, in uh, Harley Street, London. So he did get help. I was going to say you need therapy. If you're that smart, you need therapy. Did that help though? You think that helped? Maybe that you know? Oppenheimer was a, was a tall, thin chain smoker. Okay, I mean I put that together. The man's always freaking smoking in, in, in the movie, who was often neglected to eat uh, during periods of intense concentration. Honestly, this kind of sounds like me. Kind of sounds like me. Kind of sounds like me. Holy shit, I must be a genius. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Jesus. Uh, uh, many friends said that he would uh, he could be self-destructive. In one incident... Uh, where is this? Okay. In one incident... Uh, Ferguson tried to distract Oppenheimer uh, from his apparent uh, depression by telling him that he, 
Ferguson has was, was to marry his girlfriend. Oppenheimer jumped on Ferguson and tried to strangle him. Oppenheimer was plagued by periods of depression throughout his life. And he once told his brother, I need physics more than friends. Uh, once again, Kevin, thank you so much for gifting a tier one sub to the Nomad, the Kid, and, and Graham. Uh, well, where's the alert? I'm the alert. This is a totally new setup. Wasn't expecting this uh, to be popping off today. So yeah, we're, we're didn't 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 think to set that up. You know, <laughs> didn't think you guys would be dropping subs like this today. If I'm gonna be honest with you, but I appreciate the support. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, back to this. What, first of all, what a quote. I need physics more than friends. Uh, and uh, like, okay. I haven't read this before. Sri's, uh, Sri's currently during uh, doing an intense period of concentration. Yeah, it's, it's an intense period of conversation con concentration that it's like immediately distracted by the fact that I've uh, you know I'm 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 live and I'm I have a chat. Bro, Oppenheimer says an extreme chemical imbalance. Um, yeah, that's what he needed some uh, some hormone ho hormonal pills maybe. But no, um, I haven't read all this. This this stuff isn't actually in the movie about his uh, i mean he it shows that he's he has like this kind of darkness to him uh but it makes so much sense that this guy is depressed i don't mean that lightly i mean again when you have so much going on it, it makes sense that you'd have you might not have the full full the uh, belief in humanity you're not fully like oh yeah i i i believe humanity is going to do the best i he he does actually i mean it's a very famous quote that he has about you know like uh it's, it's a quote from about the bhagavad gita i'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll he'll they'll probably be mentioned here at some point and so we'll, we'll talk about it when we get there but um man that is sad though i need physics more than friends i don't know if i could ever i love movies I love movies. I, I studied movies. I, I grew up making movies. Like, you know, since I was a kid, I was always like, you know, making stuff with, you know, uh, my parents' cameras and stuff. Uh, and would I ever say I need, I need, I need movies more than friends? Strangling seems like a strong step. A strong step. Yeah. He's just trying to protect his friend from making the mistake of marriage, you know? Want to trade some movies for Austin? I don't know what that. I don't know what that means. Uh, in nineteen, yeah, okay, nineteen twenty-six, Oppenheimer left Cambridge for the University of Göttingen. That's a German word uh, to uh, to study under Max Born. Of course, we we know obviously if you've been listening from the start, the Born Oppenheimer, uh, which kind of sounds like uh, a a. Which kind of sounds like a, a crossover movie between Oppenheimer and uh, Jason Bourne. The common outlier being that uh, that Matt Damon is in both. But nevertheless, Göttingen was one of the world's leading centers for theoretical physics. Oppenheimer made friends who uh, went on to have great success, including uh, Werner Heisenberg, Paul uh, Pasquale Jordan, Wolfgang Pauli, Paul the rock hold on let's see what heisenberg so carl heisenberg was a german theoretical physicist and one of the uh main pioneers of the theory of quantum mechanics he published his work in 1925 in a breakthrough paper in the subsequent series of papers uh with max born and pascal jordan during the same time isn't he the guy that went who worked on the uh bomb for germany Following, well, well on. Hasenberg has also made contributions. Uh, I don't think he's known for his uh, for the uncertainty principle, which he published in 1927. Wow, well, he won because he wasn't short. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's a joke. Heisenberg was awarded in 1932 Nobel Prize for uh, in physics for the creation of quantum mechanics. The man created quantum mechanics, dude. Uh. Maybe not. Oh, shortly after, as there's a, I scrolled, 
SS Investigation is, is the headline or the subheading. Shortly after the discovery of the neutron by James Chadwick in 1932, Heisenberg submitted the first of three papers. Uh, oh, after Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, Heisenberg was attacked in the press as a white Jew, i.e. an Aryan who acts like a Jew. I didn't... Wow, okay. Supporters of the... Du, the the Dutz... All right, I'm just going to... German physics. That's what it is. Also known as Aryan physics, apparently, fun fact, launched vicious attacks against leading theoretical physicists, uh, including uh, Arnold uh, Sommerfield, Sommerfield and Heisenberg. From the early uh, 1930s onward, the anti-Semitic and uh, anti-theoretical physics movement, uh, the German physics, had... Let's see. Uh, concerned itself with the quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity as applied in the university environment, political factors uh, took priority over scholarly ability, even though its two most prominent supporters were the Nobel, uh, Jesus Christ, laureates in physics, Philip Leonard and Johann Stark. These names, man. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, very well known in the science com community. You know what, Joey? Describe it for me. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. And movies are to what you, what physics are to uh, was to Oppenheimer. Therefore, I was offering you, uh, you some movies to replace the Austin. Oh, I see. I see. What movies would I replace Austin with? Yeah, I got an easy one for you. Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning Part One. <laughs> <laughs> just just all the all the mission impossible movies austin's gonna be austin's livid um <laughs> so uh where's this investigation at one point as was uh 1935 the immediate faculty drew up a list of candidates to replace summerfield as uh Ordinarius, professor of theoretical physics and head of the Institute for uh, Theoretical Physics at the University of Munich. The three candidates uh, had all been former students of Summerfield, Heisenberg, uh, who had received Nobel Prize in Physics, Peter Debai, who received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Jesus Christ, and then Richard Becker, who notably does not have, as I say, does not have a Nobel Prize. Um, the Munich uh, phys uh, phys faculty, sorry, was firmly behind these candidates with Heisenberg as their first choice. However, supporters of the German physics uh, and the uh, elements in the REM had their own list of candidates, and the battle dragged on for over over four years. During the time, Heisenberg came under vicious attack by the by the German physics supporters. One attack was published in um, Das Schwarzkopf, the newspaper of the SS. Wow. Okay. Headed by Henry Hem. Henrik Henry, Henry, Heinrich Himmler. Is this Himmler? Like the Himmler? Was uh, Heinrich Luptpold Luptpold Himmler was the Reichs, Reichsfuhrer of the Stutzafel. Oh my. Dude, holy shit. German. Uh, he was a production fighter at SS, a leading member of the Nazi Party of Germany, and one of the most powerful men in the Nazi Germany, primarily known uh, for being a man, the main architect of the Holocaust. So, yeah, that's that is the Himmler. Look, at the, God damn, get this, get this man as a get this man out of my fucking face. Um, in this in this Heisenberg was called a white Jew, who should be made in made to do quote unquote disappear. This uh, probably killed. Uh, these attacks were taken seriously as Jews were violently attacked and in, in, uh, incarcerated. Heisenberg fought back with an editorial and uh, a letter to Himmler in an attempt to resolve the matter and regain his honor. At one point, Heisenberg's mother visited Himmler's, Himmler's mother. What? The two women knew each other as Heisenberg's uh, maternal grandfather and Heimler's father were rectors and members of the Bavarian hiking club? Dude, what is going on? Dude, uh, holy shit. <laughs> Eventually, Himmler settled the Heisenberg affair by sending two letters, one to SS Gruppenführer, Re uh, Reinhard 
Heydrich and one to Heisenberg, uh, both on 21st of July, 1938. In a letter to Heydrich, Himmler said Germany could not afford to lose or silence Heisenberg, as he would be useful in uh, for teaching a generation of scientists. To Heisenberg, Himmler said the letter came on recommendation of his family, and he cautioned Heisenberg to make a distinction between uh, professional physics research, uh, research results and the personal political and political attitudes uh, of the involved scientists. Holy shit, dude! This is not even. We're, we're, this is one guy. I meant to. I didn't mean. To, I didn't mean to go on a rabbit hole there. We, uh, anyway, so yeah, there's okay. I'm not gonna read all about. Uh, there's also uh, Ernest Jordan, as we said, a German uh, theoretical and mathematical physicist. Uh, Wolfgang Pauli, Paul Dirac, uh, you know Enrico Fermi, and Edward Teller. Oh shit, Edward Teller. Uh, it was a Hungarian American theoretical physicist who is uh, colloquially, colloquially, colloquially known as the father of the hydrogen bomb and one of the authors of Teller Ogham Design. Wow. <laughs> God, dude, holy shit. These people, I mean, were changing the freaking world with, like, it, as easy. It, oh my God. The world is so small, insane. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. T blown away <laughs> blown away uh, right now um he was known for being too enthusiastic in discussion sometimes to the point of taking uh over uh, seminar taking over seminar se uh, sessions this irritated some of Bo uh, born's other students as much uh, uh, so much so that maria go gopert uh, presented born with a petition signed by herself and others threatening to boycott a class unless he made oppenheimer quiet down born left it out on his desk before Oppen uh, where oppenheimer could read it and it was effective without a word being said oppenheimer obtained the his doctor of philosophy degree in the march of 1927 at age 23 supervised by born uh after the oral exam james frank Frank, um, the professor of uh, the professor ad uh, admis administering, reportedly said, "Quote: I'm glad that that's over. He was at the point of questioning me." Unquote. Oppenheimer published uh, over a dozen papers uh, while in Europe, um, including many important contributions to the field of quantum mechanics. He and Born published a famous paper, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, uh, which separates nuclear motion, which separates nuclear motion from electronic motion in the mathematical uh, treatment of molecules allowing nuclear motion to be neglected to simple uh, to simplify calculations it remains his most cited work okay uh Oppenheimer is awarded the uh, united states research council fellowship um to the california institute of technology in september 1927 casual i'm um, returning to the united states um Uh, I'm just, I'm just making sure like we're not, we're not, you know, going through, uh, do you have alerts on? I, I do not, but thanks for the bit loser. <laughs> it's Alexa. It's Alexa. It's cool. It's okay. Um, by the way, I explained the uncertainty principle. Did you really, I thought you just said you, you're not a scientist, bro. Oh, he said, but I know a lot of them, uh, a lot of them. And also I have curse, cursory interest in Kurt, uh, Kurt, cursory interest in physics as it will help with the current energy crisis there is inherent uncertainty in the act of measuring a variable of particle oh very interesting St again still so the so guy got awarded for what just being like hey i don't sometimes you don't know stuff chat chat hold on let me let me hear me out I'm I'm twenty twenty six now, and uh, I will admit that sometimes I don't know stuff, and that's that's the SDSK's principle of 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 uh, uncertainty. So, man, we got old. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. That's not the point of what what the hell is going on right now. That's not the point. 
Okay, uh, so upon returning to the United States, Oppenheimer uh, accepted an associate part, uh, professorship from the University of California, Berkeley, where Raymond T. Berg uh, wanted him so badly that he expressed a willingness to share him with Caltech. Before he uh, began his Berkeley professorship, Oppenheimer was diagnosed with a mild case of tuberculosis. What the? F- Hold on. Oh, do I know what tuberculosis is? It's an infectious disease uh, originally uh, usually caused by microbacterium tuberculosis bacteria tuberculosis generally affects the lungs but it has uh, can affect other parts of the body most infectious uh most infections show no symptoms in which case <coughs> oh jesus <coughs> i was choking um sometimes i, I don't know stuff what a quote gives free a doctorate that's all i'm that's all i'm asking for um in which case it is known as latent tuberculosis huh wow tb that's what it says. Okay. And spent some weeks uh, with his brother Frank in a New Mexico ranch, where, which he leased and eventually purchased. When he heard the ranch was available for lease, he exclaimed, Hot dog! And later, that's a that's that's how you do it, dude. Uh, and later called it uh, the Pero Caliente. Literally means hot dog in Spanish. Damn, dude. I didn't know Oppenheimer. That's not in the movie. He didn't make a discovery and then go, Hot dog ah that that makes his character so much better he's a he's a deeply depressed man who celebrates by yelling hot dog this is it um later he used to say that uh physics and uh, he later he used to say that physics and desert country were his two great loves huh that makes so pretty much i mean it I guess it makes sense, you know, theoretically, uh, to, to have like the whole shanty town that they build to be in the middle of nowhere. But maybe the guy was just like, I like deserts. Well, if I can't bring, if I can't, you know, live in the city, I don't want to live in the city. I just bring the city, city back to me. Um, I'm obviously that's. I don't, I don't think that was the entire basis of what it was. But it, he did say were his two great loves, physics and desert country. Though, honestly, considering that he didn't want, he wanted physics more than friends, he probably didn't need people. He could have just been like, I live in the deserts, and that's what I do. And I'll study physics and drop, drop some bombs. He recovered from tuberculosis and returned to Berkeley, where he uh, prospered as an advisor and collaborator to a generation of physic- uh, physicists who admired him as an intellectual ver- uh, for his uh, intellectual veracity and broad interests. His students and colleagues saw him as mesmerizing, um, uh, hypnotic in private uh, interaction, uh, but often frigid in more public settings. His associates tell, uh, fell into two camps. One saw him as an uh, aloof and impressive genius and asked, uh, Feet? That's that? I'm a fucking... I'm an idiot. Look up. Yeah, continue. Uh, aesthet? Aesthet? A person who uh, has or affects to have a special appreciation for art and beauty. Wow. So it's like aesthetic. Is that what the... F- virtuosity, by the way. Not veracity. Uh, virtuosity. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That's why I have the, this whole thing on the screen over here, so you guys can also follow along. Uh, uh, if you're if you're watching, if you're listening to this, just everything I say is 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 fact. That's not true at all. Please don't take that to heart. Um. Uh. Let's see. You recovered? Yep. 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 Oh yeah. And then uh. So he's uh, very into the aesthetic, much like, just like me. Um. If he had an Instagram, I bet it would be amazing. The other part. <laughs> I make him some jokes, and like some people who are like here for the knowledge are like, "Dude, what an idiot! Well, why would you say that?" Uh, <clears throat> the other, as a pretentious and insecure poser, his students uh, most uh, almost always fell into the former category, <laughs> adopting his walk, speech, and other mannerisms, and even his inclination for reading entire texts in original languages. Hans Beth said to him. What the hell? This is a long-ass quote. Probably the most uh, important ingredient he brought to his teaching was his exquisite taste. He also knew that there were important, uh, there were the, what the where. He also knew what were the important problems, as shown by his choice of subjects. Who truly lived with 
those problems, struggling for a solution, and he communicated his concern to the group. In its heyday, there had been eight or ten graduate students in a group and uh, and about six postgrad uh, doctoral fellows. He met this group once a day in his office and discussed with one uh, after another the status of the student's research problem. He was interested in everything, and in one afternoon, they might discuss quantum quantum electrodynamics, cosmic rays, electron pair production, and nuclear physics. Whoa, my God. Let's see. We can wrap it up, though, because it is an hour. But, well, I'm... I'm Hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm a little intrigued. I'm not going to go. Oh, Oppenheimer made important contributions to the theory of cosmic ray showers and started work that eventually led to descriptions of quantum tunneling, as we discovered. In 1931, he co-wrote a paper of relativistic theory of the photoelectric effect from his, uh, with his student Harvey Hall, in which, based on empirical evidence, he correctly disputed Dirac's assertion that the two two of the energy levels of the hydrogen atom had this have the same energy. Subsequently, one of his doctoral students, Willis Lamb, uh, determined that this was a consequence of what best known as the Lamb shift. What determined that this was a consequence of what became known as the Lamb shift? So he got named after himself, for which Lamb was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. Every everybody we're talking about is aesthete. That's how you say it. There you go, Chad. Or listeners, viewers, chum bags, whatever you would like to be called. Uh, they have a photo of phys- physicist Albert Einstein and uh, and the boy Oppenheimer. Wow. Uh, let's see here. In the late 1930s, Oppenheimer became interested in astrophysics. Uh, most likely through his friendship with uh, Richard Tolman, resulting in a series of papers. In the first of these, 1938, paper co-written with Robert Serber, titled On the Stability of Stellar Neutron Cores, Oppenheimer explored the properties of white dwarfs. This is followed by a paper co-written with one of his students, George Volkoff, on massive Neuron cores, neutron cores, sorry, in which they demonstrated there was a there was a limit, uh, the so-called Tolman Oppenheimer Volkoff limit to the mass of stars beyond which uh, they would remain not wouldn't sorry to the mass of stars beyond which they would not remain stable as neutron stars and would undergo gravitational collapse. So, so it was demonstrated there was a limit. So after the limit to the mass of the stars, they go beyond the limit, they become unstable. And collapse. I understood that. I, I made. I got you, brother. Your stash is bitter. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I did. I'm glad that the one thing I have over Albert Einstein, the stash. You know, I'm out here rocking a stash that that Einstein could only hope for. You know, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, let's see here. After World War II, Oppenheimer published only five scientific papers, one of which was about biophysics and none after 1950. Uh, Murray Gelman, Gelman, a later noblest, of course, of course, as a, a visiting student, worked with him at the Institute uh, of Advanced Study in 1951, offered his opinion. He didn't have a sitting flesh, when, uh, when you sit on a ch- sit on a chair, as far as I know, he never wrote a long paper or did a long calculation, anything of that kind. He didn't have patience for that. His own work consisted of little, what the apricus? I'm gonna look it up. It's A P E R C with a little thing under it. U S. A common or brief reference that makes an illuminating or entertaining point. Okay, but quite brilliant ones. So you just kind of made like small little like. Um, like remarks, just like observations, like uh, what if this, and then it just happened to be something that was so far above what what people might would you know as casually as I would say you know fucking hot dog, you get it, you get it. Uh, <laughs> but he inspired other people to do things, and his influence was fantastic, which I guess makes sense. A lot of his students went on to 
win awards and shit, so it makes sense. Uh, I'm not going to go... Okay, so these are the last two things I'm going to talk about because we can keep going on and on, but I'm going to do the last two things uh, here. We're going to talk about, first, the his private and political life a little bit, and then we're going to touch on his mysticism uh, just because I think that'd be uh, I think that'd be interesting conversation, and then we're gonna wrap it up for the first rabbit hole. <laughs> um, no, but okay, so here we go. Uh, let's go up a little bit. Okay, during the okay, cool. During the 1920s, Oppenheimer remained uninformed on worldly matters. He claimed that he did not read newspapers or popular magazines, and only learned uh, of the Wall Street crash in, of 1929 while he was on a walk with Ernest Lawrence six months after the crash occurred. One second, take a break. Honestly, same. Uh, <clears throat> he once remarked that he never cast a vote until the 1936 presidential election. From uh, Sorry. From 1934 on, he became an incre uh, increasingly concerned. He became increasingly concerned about politics and international affairs. In 1934, he earmarked the three percent of his uh, annual salary, about hundred dollars, equivalent to two thousand two hundred dollars, uh, in 2022, for two years to support German physicists fleeing Nazi Germany. Uh, during the 1934 West Coast watermark, he and some of his students, including Melville Phillips and Bob Serber, attended a longshoreman's rally. Oppenheimer repeatedly, uh, repeatedly attempted to get a Serber, uh, get Serber position at Berkeley, but was blocked uh, by Burge, who felt that, quote, one Jew in the department was enough. Ah, gotta, gotta love the 1930s. Missed the bus there, bud. Did I miss the I missed the bud? Where's the butt? What go back? Who did not have a butt? Someone didn't Who didn't have a butt? What butt? What butt are you talking about? Who had who had the butt? Or who didn't have a butt? <laughs> I don't I don't know I don't know what, what you were what you were referring to. Oppenheimer's mother died in 1931, and he became closer to his father, who, although still living in New York, became a frequent visitor of, in California. After his father died in 1937, just six years apart, I guess, uh, equivalent to, uh, oh, leaving 392,000, sorry, when his father died in 1937, leaving $392,602 dollars, equivalent of $7.99 million in 2022 to be divided between Oppenheimer and his brother Frank, Oppenheimer immediately wrote out a will that left his estate to the University of California to be used for graduate scholarships. Wow. Like many young intellectuals in 1930s, Oppenheimer supported uh, social reforms that were later categorized as communist ideas. He d uh, donated to many progressive causes considered to be left-wing during the McCarthy era, the majority of his allegedly radical work consisted of hosting fundraisers to, for the Republican cause in the uh, Spanish Civil War and other anti-fascist activity. I think that we'll flesh you sitting on bud uh, right now, but I'm sitting on my. Oh, are you talking about my butt? I'm talking about my butt. Oh, you said something. There's something about not sitting flesh. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah about how he did, didn't sit still and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sitting on my butt, though. You know, I mean, that's why that's why I'm sitting on. Um, so, I do think that you know, from from my understanding of this man for the last, which from the three hours last night and the, the you know the over hour now today, I do fi I do feel like he was not. I don't think he was necessarily a communist, but I do think he was a vehement anti-fascist. Understandably so. Sure, yeah, you know, but because uh, <clears throat> he was obviously, um, you know, question about like how he was a communist and stuff. This guy sounds like a decent human being. Well, you know, with some ticks in his early years, it seems uh, we've gone through a journey here. <laughs> There's been a story arc <laughs> going through going through everything we've we, we've read. Uh, he done it as yep 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 yep. yep. Uh, allegedly radical work. Oh, the majority of his allegedly radical work consisted of 
opposed to doing fundraisers for the Republican stat- uh, cause. Of- yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. He never openly joined. Oh, there we go. He never openly joined the Communist Party uh, of USA or CPUSA, though he did give money to leftist causes by which, uh, by way of acquaintances who were alleged to the Communist Party members. To be. Uh, when he joined the Manhattan Project in 1942, Oppenheimer wrote in his personal security questionnaire that he had been a member of just about every communist front organization on the West Coast. Later, he claimed that he did not remember saying this, but it was not true, and that if he had said anything along those lines, it was a half jo- uh, jocular, jocular overstatement. Look at a joke. Uh, he was a subscriber to the People's World, a communist party organ, uh, and he testified in 1954, I, quote, I was associated with the communist movement uh, from 1930, unquote, from 1937 to 1942, Oppenheimer was a member of Berkeley of what he called a discussion group, which was later identified by fellow members uh, Hacken Chevalier Chevalier, and Gordon uh, Griffiths as a closed secret unit of the communist party of Berkeley faculty. Wow. The FBI opened the uh, file on Oppenheimer in March uh, 1941. It recorded uh, that it recorded that he attended a meeting in December 1940 at Chevier, che, Chev, Chevaliers, Chevalier's house. Uh, again, terrible with names. <laughs> uh, that was also attended by the Communist Party California State Secretary uh, William Schneiderman. And it's uh, Treasurer Isaac Falkoff. Oh, shit. I didn't even say... That's so unfortunate. I didn't mean to say it like that. <laughs> Isaac, I'm sure you're a great dude. <laughs> God damn. The FBI noted that Oppenheimer was uh, on the executive committee of the American Civil uh, Liberties Union, and it considered a communist front organization. Shortly thereafter, the FBI added Oppenheimer to its custodial detention index for arresting case of national emergency. Wow, so they just have this custodial detec- detention index. This is, is a system used to track American civ- uh, citizens and other people by the FBI before the adoption of computerized databases. Wow, dude. They just have a list of people. They're like, hey, yeah, this shit hits the fan. If there's ever like any doubt of someone who this guy probably fucked it up. You know what I mean? It's just th- these people just get him, put them in the fucking jail first. What? I guess. I guess, you know, national security and all that. I mean, I mean, uh, what a smart thing to do. Really. Genius, really, when I think about it. What a good, that's smart. Good thing. Oof. Oof. (laughs) Open Numbers Party uh, membership, or lack thereof, has been debated. Almost all historians agree that he was strong left-wing views during his time and interacted with... um, during this time and interacted with party members, but it is but it is disputed whether he was officially a member of the party. At his 1954 security clearance hearings, which the movie also is very much so, uh, it takes place during, he denied being a member of the Communist Party, but identified himself as a fellow traveler, which he defined as, a, as someone who agrees with many of communism's goals, but he's not willing to blindly follow orders from any co- uh, Communist Party apparatus. In August 1943, he volunteered to Manhattan Project secret, uh, security agents that George Eltonton, whom he did not know, had solicited, had solicited three men at Los Alamos for nuclear secrets on behalf of the Soviet Union. When pressed on the issue in later interviews, Oppenheimer admitted the only person who had approached him uh, was his friend Hakan Chevalier. Ch- Chevalier? Ch- Chevalier? Ah, dude, I'm sorry. Uh, not that they're going to listen to this. A Berkeley professor of French literature who had mentioned the matter privately at a dinner at Oppenheimer's house. Brigadier General Leslie R. Groves Jr., the director of Manhattan Branch, is I want to see what this guy looks like in real life. Wow, that's and that's who um, Matt Damon plays, I think, right? In the movie. Wow, he, he does have a mustache. Once again, not not quite not quite like, you know, my mustache. But one one could argue, uh, you know, just like with Einstein, probably a more important person. Uh, than, <laughs> The director of the Manhattan Project, uh, though um, Oppenheimer, so, uh, uh, sorry, so Leslie R. Groves Jr. thought Oppenheimer too, was, was too important to the project to be uh, ousted over his suspicious behavior. On July 20th, 1943, he wrote to the Manhattan Engineer District, quote, 
In attendance with my verbal directions of July 15th, it is desired that clearance be issued to Julius Robert Oppenheimer without delay, irrespective of the information which you are concer- which you have concerning Mr. Oppenheimer. He is absolutely essential to the project. That's fascinating to be able to... So in the movie, they actually they, they talk about how he do, like he has to do something to get his clearance but to this is what the this is what he wrote like to read now we know what like uh, now i know what he wrote in the movie they just you know he's like get me the security clearance he's like all right you know and leslie yargroves go you know goes and he gets the security clearance and then i like in a, a few scenes later whatever. all right last thing uh by the way yeah relationships and children he had two children he was married to uh kitty uh, he was involved with uh, Jean Tatlock, the daughter of the Berkeley literature professor and st- uh, student of Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, the two had similar political views, and um, she hated flowers, apparently. But, uh, yeah, he married Kitty. Uh, she obtained a B.A. from uh, in botany from the University of Pennsylvania, UPenn. Uh, there she married Richard Harrison, a physician. A, oh, a physician, and medical researcher in 1938, 1939. Kitty and Harrison moved to Calif- Pasadena, California, where he became a chief of radiology at a local hospital, and she enrolled as a graduate student at the UK, uh, U, U, Penn, University of California. Uh, and Oppenheimer and Kitty uh, created a minor scandal by sleeping together after one of Tolman's parties. Wow! In the summer of 1940, he stayed with Oppenheimer. Uh, she, sorry, in the summer of 1940, she stayed with Oppenheimer at his ranch in New Mexico. She finally asked uh, Harrison for a divorce when he found out she was pregnant. When he refused, she obtained a quick divorce in uh, Reno, Nevada, and took Oppenheimer as her fourth husband on November 1st. Good Lord. Oh, wait. Oh, we, we missed the first two. Right. Kitty was married before. She was Her first marriage lasted only a few months. Her second common-law marriage husband was uh, Joe Dellett, Dellett, an active member of the Communist Party, who was killed in the Spanish Civil War. So those are four husbands. Uh, Oppenheimer came in. She had two children. First child was Peter. And uh, the second was Catherine. So there it is. But the last thing we're going to talk about is mysticism. And uh, I find this uh, just, just interesting. And so we're going to talk about this, and then we're going we're gonna to call it a, call it a time because it's going to be like an hour and a half, and I feel like this is uh, probably the weirdest content that I've ever made ever. Uh Oppenheimer's uh, diverse interests sometimes interrupted his focus on science. He liked things that were difficult and uh, were difficult. And since much of the scientific work appeared easy for him, he developed an interest in the myth, mystical and the cryptic. God damn, he's like me. Uh, Science is just too easy for me, really. Like I, I know, you know, I mean, I know AR is the freaking argon, you know, on the elements. So like, science is just too easy for me, guys. So I'm, uh, that's why I always write books. My 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 books. That's why they're always uh, something grot- something horror or uh, something like that. You know. Speaking of um, the lesser evil, of it is available now on uh, Amazon. Oh, go ahead and check it out. It's a cyberpunk noir novella that I wrote. So there you go. That's my plug for the day, for the episode. Uh, after leaving Harvard, he began to acquaint himself with classical Hindu texts through their English translations. He also had an interest in learning language and learned Sanskrit under Arthur W. Ryder at Berkeley in 1933. He eventually read literary, literary works such as the Bhagavad Gita and the Meg, Meguda, Megaduta. What What is that? I actually don't know what that is. So it is M E G H A D U T A, literally is called the cloud, cloud messenger is a lyric uh, is a lyric poem, written by Kalidasa. Oh, is this? Oh, okay, cool. All right, let's go back. Um, so he read them in the original Sanskrit and deeply pondered them. He later cited the uh, the Gita as one of his books that often sh- uh, the most shaped his philosophy of life. He wrote to his brother that the Gita was very easy and quite marvelous, and called it quote the most beautiful philosophical song existing in any known tongue. Unquote. He later gave copies to it as of it as presents to his friends and kept a personal worn out copy on his bookshelf by his desk. He even nicknamed his car Garuda. Wow, that's that's freaking crazy. Yeah, so I, I knew that actually, like, that's one simple. The Mount Bird of the Hindu god Vishnu. Yes, the Garuda is, is so, um, yeah, I mean, they, they describe it as the, the Mount Bird. But, like, it's, um, you know, 
when like Vishnu or certain gods are like, you know, uh, in temples or ceremonies where like they kind of have them circle the whole, whole like temple and stuff in like certain uh, special auspicious days or whatever. So they have this, the, the, they put them on like this chariot that, that, that is called the Garuda to kind of symbolize, sim, symbolize the, you know, the Garuda. That's crazy. I mean, obviously he, I knew that his famous quote, again, I'm not sure if it's in here, but well, if I, if it's not here by the end, I'll, I'll, I'll say it, but the fact that he was, I did not know he was so, um, he was so intrigued by, by Hinduism. Nonetheless, Oppenheimer never became a Hindu in the traditional sense. He did not join any temple nor pray to any god. He, quote, was really taken by the charm and general wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita, said his brother. Uh, Oppenheimer's interest in Hindu th- uh, in Hinduism thought, uh, oh, sorry, Oppenheimer's interest in Hindu thought is speculated to have uh, started from his earlier association with Niles Bohr. Both Bohr and Oppenheimer had been very uh, analytical and critical about the ancient Hindu mythological stories and the me- metaphysics imbued in them. That's fascinating. I didn't, I didn't know there was meta. What? In one conversation with David Hawkins before the war, that while talking about the literature of ancient Greece, Oppenheimer remarked, quote, I have read the Greeks. I find the Hindus deeper. Unquote. That's him, not me. That's, he's, not, he's saying that. I, I feel like I, you know, don't want this shit to be clipped. Oppenheimer, oh, sorry. He was, he, his close uh, confidant, we're almost done, by the way. His close confidant and colleague, Isidore Rab- Rabi, who was um, who has seen Oppenheimer throughout his Berkeley, Los Alamos, and Princeton years, wondering why men of Oppenheimer's gift do not consider discover everything without uh, worth discovering, reflected that quote Oppenheimer was overeducated in those fields which lie outside of the, uh, outside the scientific tradition, such as his interest in religion and the Hindu religion in particular, which was, resulted in a feeling of the mystery of the universe that surrounded him like a fog, almost like a fog. He saw physics clearly, looking uh, toward. Uh, what had what had already been done, and at the br- uh, border, he tended to feel there was much more of the, of the mysterious and novel than there were actually was. He turned away from the hard, crude methods of theoretical physics in a mystical realm or broad instu- uh, intuition. In Oppenheimer, the element of earthiness was feeble, yet it was essentially this spiritual equality, or sorry, quality with refinement as expressed in such. And speech and manner that was his basis of his that was the basis of his charisma i'm struggling this is what apparently my body's like i'm almost done i'm out of here uh these may be the qualities of the born leader who seem to be have uh reserves of uncommitted strength unquote all right last last thing i want to read in spite of this uh observers such as the nobel prize winning physicist luis alvarez who what did, what did luis alvarez that's a familiar name. He's a physicist, discovery. Oh, so in awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1968 for his discovery of resonance states in particle physics during the hydrogen bubble chamber. Wow. So Louis Alvarez has, just, has God damn it, suggested that if he had lived long enough to see the prediction substanti- uh, substantiated by experiment, Oppenheimer might have won a Nobel Prize for his work on gravitational collapse concerning neuron, neutron stars and black holes. In retrospect, some physicists historian, and historians consider this his most important contribution, though it was not taken uh, up by other scientists in his lifetime. The physicist and historian Abraham uh, Pais once said, uh, asked Oppenheimer what he considered his most important scientific contributions. Oppenheimer cited his work on electrons and positrons, not his work on gravitational uh, contraction. Oppenheimer was nominated for the Nobel Prize for Physics three times, in 1946, in 1951, and in 1967, but never won. So it's not here. Let's let's let's, let's wrap it up. Let's go back let's do it to me. It's not here, but he there is a very famous Oppenheimer quote uh, that he. Uh, that is in the movie and also uh, 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 there's, there's like, I believe there's actually like a clip of him actually uh, actually saying it as well so this is um, what he said the words that you know were kind of in his in his head after watching the Trinity test. 
uh, he said uh, a quote from the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And there it is. That is Oppenheimer. The, the story of Oppenheimer, the life of Oppenheimer, whatever it is, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, that was um, wha- a crazy hour and a half. A little less than an hour and a half, but, uh, you know. I, I mean, we went through so much in this. It was a real roller coaster of uh, of just like, you know, of, of facts, if you will. Thank you guys so much for, for hanging out and, wa- and watching and listening. If Wherever you're listening to this, you know, give it a rating. If you're watching this, like the video, subscribe. Uh, thank you to everybody who who uh, watched live and subscribed. Obviously, Joey, Kevin, um, Alexa. Thank you guys to everybody for uh, for that support. I appreciate it. And, uh, oh, you know what? Here, let me sweeten the deal. Let me sweeten the deal here. Let me, I'll do it, I'll do it myself. Uh, let's see, jump bag. And here we go. Boom, I'm subscribed as well. There it is. And with that said, guys, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you very much for listening to me talk for a little bit. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, make sure you uh, do everything I said. <laughs> it's all right, Joey. I appreciate appreciate you uh, appreciate you hanging in there, though. I enjoy you. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad you did enjoy me. But as I said, people, as always, thank you very much for watching. Thanks for listening, and as always, until next time. Have a good night, a good morning, and a damn good time.